Hi, everybody. Uh, we are here with Steve L. Keller, right? Steve uh, just told this fascinating story yesterday with Laura um, about a journey that I, I'm sure you're going to either read about or see on television. <laughs> um, and it's about, um, you know, um, somebody who was very innovative in a time where innovation uh, was still um, kind of secretive to the public. Um, so you had you had basically uh, developed a control uh, of a market share of the um, basically life settlement industry? Correct. Okay. Yep. And you had uh, devised a way to, um, maybe you could tell us real quick, you had you had figured out how to get money from insurance companies that wasn't being... Yeah. So... Uh, thank you for filling in the blank. <laughs> okay. We, we, uh, we, we basically uh, created the life settlements. Okay, and yeah. and what is a life settlement? Life settlement is a practice of buying uh, a life insurance policy mm -hmm. that, that it already exists from somebody that's sixty five years or older. Okay, and you bought it from the individual. Correct. So so if you had a uh, uh, a million dollars worth of policy or okay. insurance policy, so we might give you anywhere from forty thousand to eighty thousand, depends on. Uh, I, I could cash in on that basically and use it to my own. And then what would you do with it? So we would uh, transfer the ownership beneficiary over to us or another entity, mm -hmm. and uh, we packaged them up and sold them as bonds and on Wall Street. Okay. And you, at the time, this was around 2000, around 2000, late, 2002? Late, late 90s, uh, early 2000s. Okay. Yeah. You had developed a company called uh, Calco. Calco, and mm -hmm. you guys had, had sort of cornered the market with about a 65% control of the market at the time? Yeah, we had some uh, 30,000 agents in this country. So there were people taking note of you you weren't aware of, or maybe you were aware of. Uh, some I wasn't, no. <laughs> <laughs> but you were dining with presidential candidates, you were at the White House, you were living a life, you were making $25 million a year, is that, is that right? Uh, the last year, I think it was, uh, that was the tops. Yeah. Wow. Because I remember uh, writing a $12.5 million check to the government. Wow. So I want to come back to that, but you end up getting raided by the government. Correct. By the FBI at the time? Uh, FBI and Postal Service. Postal Service is the one that uh, led the charge. All right, so they didn't have any real uh, sort of infractions that you had, so they brought the Postal Service in to say you had mail fraud uh, was your main violation. Actually, there was a group of insurance companies that um, that tendered the uh, uh, the FBI to do this, and they turned them down and said there was no fraud. So, okay. so they went and got to lower rung, which is the uh, Postal Service. Uh, to lead to charge. Wow. And so this is where it really gets you. I mean, you decide at this point, you're out. You're headed to Panama with then your wife. Yes. And your two kids. Correct. And you've got some money on you. It gets really exciting there. How long were you actually in Panama before the FBI found you? We were on the run uh, six months total. Okay. And yeah. you were, you we, were we, living? We stopped at uh, uh, Cancun, Mexico first, and then Got on a plane and went over to Panama after that. Your story about the red light, green light is my experience every time I go down there. Although I don't smuggle anything, <laughs> there's still this thing about when you cross into uh, Mexico, uh, they're going to search your bags if you t if you hit the button and you get a red light, um, and they're going to let you go by if you get a green light. the 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 irony is, it, it's really easy to distract them even if you get the red light. The amount of uh, they're they're roughly 50 years behind on airport security, in my opinion, but. Um, that's a great story you should tune in and listen to. Um, you end up getting a jail sentence for 11 years? Uh, well, 14 to begin with. But, Prison, uh, I'm sorry. Yeah, and then that was uh, on uh, resentencing. We wanted on an appeal, so it was uh, remanded down to uh, nine years. Right on. So give me a real quick, going back to uh, what you were doing for business and how you were making your money. Can you tell me how that relates to uh, th what you see going on in the world today as far as apps and disruptors and uh, people who are seeing ways to exploit already exploited systems? It's like, <laughs> uh, I, think, I think folks out here should be aware that when you poke a bear, uh, sometimes a bear can run very fast at you. And uh, uh, you know, what, what, can, what, can, what happens behind the scenes uh, in DC and mm -hmm. how these private industries are using the Department of Justice as their hit guys to get rid of their competitors. Get rid of their competitors. That's that's kind of important. Is there a, a, a business or an app that's current that you admire that you see them doing something? 
Well, I mean, you can't help but think about uh, Elon and what he's done. Okay. And is doing. Right. But uh, uh, that would be the extreme. But, uh, yeah, I see, uh, like, you know, the Uber apps and the food delivery apps, and I think it's just – it's changed the game in all those industries, you know. Yeah, I agree. I think when Uber really started getting big, I started looking at cab drivers and cab unions differently. Correct. And wondering how they were going to compete or survive. Uh, and now I don't even think of them anymore because all I think of is Lyft and the other apps that exactly. now uh, have taken over the industry. And in, in, in a nutshell, that was kind of what the uh, insurance industry was seeing when you came around. They were seeing that they were losing control. Of, of profits basically i think i think we uh we scared them really right. bad and um uh when the economy report came out and said how big this industry was or the potential of it um they they really um took action against us you know at that yeah. point yeah it got pretty serious yeah you have to tune into the episode the stories are chilling i, I mean i really i'm so glad that uh, you, you guys are putting this into a book um it's going to be called paid to play Correct. Um, and it'll talk a lot about this as well as the personal stories along the way. You ended up in federal prison in Kentucky. Is that That's right? correct. Okay. And you ran into one of our guests. I did. Chaz yep. Allen. Um, and uh, the great thing about Chaz is he also wrote a book and made a movie about his journey, mm -hmm. uh, which is another great story. Um, when you decided to write the book, what was your goal? What did you want to do? Did you want to tell on some people? Did you want to tell your story? No, I, one thing I'm not doing is uh, I'm not pointing fingers in okay. this book. Uh, I'm just telling the story, and mm -hmm. I let the reader infer from there. Uh, but there was a lot of inter interactions um, with people from D.C. There's a lot of um, a lot of pretty heavy people All involved right. here. You, so you're catching some attention now as you're writing this book too. Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know you. I know you know what you're doing. Yeah. Um, but uh, I I appreciate that. I love a story like that. Um, a couple of things. Um, what's life like for you now? So you spent, you ended up, you, you got 14, you got an appeal down to 11, you did eight? Uh, eight and a half, yeah. Eight and a half. So mm -hmm. when did you get out? Uh, 2012. Okay, so you've been out for a, d a decade now. Yeah. Um, how's that been? How's? It's been challenging. Yeah. Uh, I'm really uh, inhibited a lot what I can do now because of the background. Mm -hmm. And, uh it's it's mind blowing. I mean, when I first got out, I had a bank account at uh, Chase, and I was working a job and depositing my check, and and I got called in one day, and they said uh, we got to close your account. And I said why? And I, all I'm doing is working and putting a check in the bank, and they said uh, you are a threat to the bank. Oh wow! So the perception it hangs with me, and uh, uh, very limited what I can do. Right. You you're back. Uh, you lived with your kids and raised your kids. Yes. And came home. Yes. Um, and they're grown up and going to school. And can yeah. you give us a little bit of sort of where they 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 lie with us? How do they see your your journey? Um. Well, I mean, they they're on board uh, with me as far as they understand everything now. You explained real well. And that's one of the reasons I wrote the book initially. Okay. Uh, for them. Okay. Because uh, I want them to know the true story. Oh, that's fantastic. And also want my employees to know the true story because I can't imagine, but all these years, a lot of them don't have a clue what happened. Sure, sure. How many employees did you have at the time? A hundred. A hundred. Well, have you gotten in touch with some of them? Or? Yes. Oh, good. Yep. Yeah. Well, we wish you the best. I'm, I'm uh, so glad that you flew in for this interview and came to be a part of telling your story at the house with us. Um, and like Laura said, you were wonderful with our animal. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. So. I love dogs. Yeah, thank you. And uh, uh, tune in for the episode. Uh, go back to yesterday's and uh, see Steve Keller's episode uh, or hear it. And uh, thank you again for being on the show. Thank you for having me. All right.